May the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, be the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, be the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, be the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run and the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide and the ransom of my life, he is my Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sail, the anchor in the wave, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, and the echo of my days, oh, he is my song.
promise you have made, I believe in God.
and streets there is no night every tear is wiped away you will know no sorrow worship him with joyful sound sing until your voice gives out no matter where you are oh it all. you can never be raised to life if you have died oh and if you've been buried into Jesus Christ it's only if you have died that you could never be raised to life born again you talk about you've been born again but you can't be born again unless you are planted into Christ. You can't be born again. You talk about being born again. But you can't be born again unless you are planted into Christ. So if you have died, and if you've been buried with Jesus Christ, it's only if you've died with Christ that you can never be raised to life. Amen? It's if you have died and only if you've been buried into Jesus Christ. It's only if you've died with Christ that you can never be raised to life. I said if you have died and if you've been buried into Jesus Christ, it's only if you've died with Christ that you can never be raised to life. Born again, people say they are born again. But you can't be born again unless you are planted into Christ. Don't you know how you're not born again and you can't never be? Let me tell you this morning, you can't be born again unless you are planted into Christ. Oh, you can't be born again. No, never, never, no. You can't be born again. Don't you know that? You can't be born again unless you are planted into Christ. So if you have died, and only if you've been buried into Jesus Christ, if you have died with Christ, that you can never be raised to life. It's only if you have died, and only if you've been buried into Jesus Christ. It's only if you've died with Christ that you can never be raised to life. Ever be raised to life. Ever be raised to life. That's a scary song. Something scary about that song, isn't it? It's so final and kind of morbid sounding, but so true. Everybody said they're born again. I hear them say they're born again. Oh, they talk about being born again, but they're not planted into Christ. Oh, you're not.
not born again and you can't be born again you'll never be born again unless you are planted into Christ it's only if you have died and if you've been buried into Jesus Christ it's only if you have died with Christ that you can never be raised to life if you have died with Christ, you will be raised to life. Amen? Romans chapter 6 says this. Romans chapter 6 says this. Here is the, here's the foundational song. Derek, my brother, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, Namara. The kids are around. He said, what should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How should we do the dead to sin living longer therein? Know you not, I like this, know you not that as many as you as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. That's why I said, it's only if you've died. Therefore being buried in him by baptism and you've been buried into Jesus Christ. It's only if you've died with Christ that you will ever be raised to life. The Bible says only if you've died and you have been buried into Jesus Christ. It says only if you've died with Christ that you can never be raised to life. That you will ever be, oh, my Lord, my Lord, what a truth. <laughs> Brother Abnus, what a truth, what a truth. Only if you have died and you've been buried in Christ can you ever be raised to life, my Lord. It's good to be baptized in Jesus' name. That's a, that is a scary song. <laughs> That's a scary song. I don't know, I sang it and I thought, ooh, I'm, I'm scared of the song. If you hear it, and you've not been buried in Christ, you should be scared. That's a scary song. That song is a warning. To me, it's a warning. To those who said, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, later on, next week. Okay. I'm sure there are many people who said they would do it, but they never did. Sometimes um, you don't get the chance. Let's be happy. First John chapter 3. <laughs> First John chapter 3. God's been good. I had a good day today. Oh, yeah. I spoke to the builder today. I, I love my builder. I said, builder, listen, I made plans. Okay, Rob, what are your plans? My plans are to build this thing and uh, lay the slab down in October. Sounds great, Rob. I got my plumber. I got my brick guy. I got my slab guy. Sure, Rob. Hey, paid the plumber. I said, um, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm just here to help you. You know, I like it because most builders, if they have a big multi-million dollar project, they want to take, oh, well, I take 33%. We spoke to a building manager. One day we were in the city. We are getting some chairs, I think. And there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a, a university degree that you can get called building management, right? Construction manager. And what it is, you basically give them your plans and they give you a building. But it costs you, it costs you minimum, Tammy. How much did it cost, Tammy? Minimum? $250 a square meter, minimum. To, huh? $250 a square meter. And our, our church is almost 1,000 square meters. So you're looking at $2.5 million for them to build it. Times 1,000 square meters. Yeah. No, 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 not 250,000. Whatever he said, he meant, what well, was 25,000 then, 2.5 thousand, 2,500, 2,500, sorry. Yeah, it was 2.5 million. I mean, if, if it could, I mean, we can't even lay the slab for that, you know, so, yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, 2.5 million? I think we can come a little under that, you know? So we have, um, we, have everything in, in, we have everything set. And I've told the builder, we have everything set. 
And um, we're going to meet with him sometime next week. And uh, the plumber and the and the, the slab guy and maybe, maybe the brick guy and the steel guy. We'll all get together at the site and we'll, we'll tell them what we want done. But the good thing about it is that we get to dictate what we want done and they get to oversee what we do and make sure we do it properly. So it's safe for everybody. I don't have to lift a screw, but I do know what I... I do know how to save money and I know how I want it done so we don't have to pay uh, you know, a ridiculous amount of price for everything. So God's good. He is good unto us. In the book of John chapter 3... So I assume, I'm saying by faith, Tamara, by faith we say, by December of next year, we're in that building. Yes? Once, once a slab is laid in October, we'll have a slab party. Yes? We had a party at your house. You're the only one who gets parties. Sister Dixon, hey, she gets a slab party. You know, walk up and down the slab, you know? Once it's dried, of course, but... We, we are, we're doing it at that time of the year because it's not so, you know, it's a, it's a good, mild sort of time, some good time for the slab to dry, and then um, we get, our, we get our, um, our metal guy to put all the metal up, and then we put the framing around it, and, and we're pretty much ready to go after that. Literally, once the guy puts the, puts, the, um, puts the walls up, we can put the carpet down, a little carpet tile, we got a worship service, here we brother, we can put some flashlights over us, you know, daytime. My neighbor promised me, he said, Robert, I'm not going to give you trouble. And he's been pretty good. He, he started out a little bit silly, you know, the neighbor. But we had, we, I, I, I was gentle, and I, was, I talked to him nicely, and, you know, we've become very good friends. When, you're, when you have a church, the last thing you want is your neighbor being grumpy at you, calling the council every time you do something, you know. You want to understand. I work with him, he works with me. So, God's good. We're, we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there very fast now. We're flying along. Verses, um, we, we spoke last week about, um, <laughs> we had some funny messages. Um, it says, my little children, let us not love in word, um, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby know you that we, are the, that we are of the truth. And then he says this most important thing, and I think this is the title of our Bible study. He says, and, and shall, we shall know that we are of the truth, before you can assure your heart, you have to know you're saved. Um, it's not the pastor that convinces you that you're saved, although I do play a role, and the Word of God um, is the means by which I do that, and the Spirit of God is the means by which that's done. But he says that in order for you, before you can assure your heart, you see, if you're assuring your heart that you're saved, but you don't have the truth, it's, it's pretty much a waste of time. Because the order that he gives is this, and hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. I think a lot of people are assuring their hearts before him, but they're not saved. Uh, why? You haven't got the truth. You, how, can you, how can your heart be assured if you haven't got the truth? And if your heart is assured, but you haven't got the truth, then you're deceived. But if you do have the truth, and you know what the truth is, and what it sounds like, and you understand what the, what the Bible and what the Scripture confirms as truth, um, then you are able to assure your hearts. And in, in essence, what that's telling you is that you're making your, your heart have full confidence. You don't have any doubts about where you're going. Or the outcome of your journey I think it's a, a great shame if you're a Christian and you've journeyed to the end and when you get to your deathbed you're not really sure whether you're gonna make it in or not that's I, I, I think that would be awful <laughs> to get to the end and not be sure whether you're gonna make it or not um, it's pretty easy to make it once you have the truth. Um, if anything is wrong, you confess it before God. And after that, there is nothing for you to stress anymore about because God's grace takes over. I said any, anything that's wrong, you confess it before God. And after that, grace takes over. Everybody say, if anything is wrong, what do you do? And then what happens? 
then grace takes over. And that's how, that, that, is, that is how you're supposed to die. And the devil hates that principle because I suppose he would have tried to, to tell King David, oh, you did this awful thing, this awful thing, this awful thing. But as David was going down into his grave, having done this awful thing, you know, like we don't even come, we're not even in his, in his um, imagine we're not even in his league of things that he does. That's insane, you know. And yet David died with such an assurance. He died with such an assurance and he did not know Christ as in the gospel of Christ. But, but he prophesied about it and he spake of it and he was a partaker of it in so many ways that by the time he died, the Bible talked about the sure mercies of David and said that David is going to be all right. I said, may, may you, who are better than David, May you have at least some of the confidence. May you have, you who are better than David, may you have some of the confidence that David died with in his death. Because David was assured of this one thing, that God's love, that God's love was over him. And his banner over me is love. And he said that your, your hearts may, may it said, and, and shall assure our hearts, not today, but I notice the, the time frame that he says, he says, your, and shall assure your hearts. And hereby we know that we know the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. We shall assure our hearts before we get before him, before we stand before him, our hearts must be assured. Um, you don't want to get before him and you're not sure. If you're not sure, come and see me and I will open the scriptures so that you can sing with all the saints. Blessed assurance. Mm -hmm. You can say, Jesus is mine. And you can say, oh, what a, a glory divine. We are the heirs of salvation. We have been purchased. A blood born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I have Christ. You want to have that assurance. And I believe that you can only have that assurance by the word. I don't want to have any assurance by any other way. I want to have that assurance by the word. I don't even want to have that assurance because of my righteousness. Um, I don't want to say I have attained because of my righteousness. I want to have that assurance because of his love and his grace towards us. And I don't think you can have a greater assurance than that. And that's what David wants his, um, the, the, the writer wants you to understand here. He says this, but if our hearts condemn us. You see, there is a, a quality about the human heart. Not about the Bible says your, your heart is deceitfully wicked. I mean, it, your, your heart is more deceitfully wicked than you even understand tonight. It is, it is more deceitfully wicked than you, what you understand your heart is the biggest flipper flopper it is unbelievable it's such a flipper flopper isn't it it's you know it's it's a, it's a it's an awful thing the flipper flopper heart because one minute your heart will be with you in whatever evil you're doing and the next minute, it flops. And it's against you because of what you did. You know, your, your heart is really very much like the devil. It, 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 it's, it's, there's something, it's, 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 it's so deceitfully wicked that I would even say that your heart is really <laughs> so much like the devil. Who compelled Judas? Who compelled Judas to betray the Lord? The devil, I took the sup, and the devil entered into him, and the devil told him to betray him. After he betrayed him, who told him to go kill himself? The devil. The devil is amazing because in one sense, he is, he is all right behind you and encouraging you, and he's pushing you, and then after you've done it, he's, boom, he's right on you. What, what is that? Forget the devil. Your heart does the exact same thing. 
it's deceitfully wicked. But it's not deceitfully wicked in that it does or it thinks or it acts out what is error, but it is that your heart encourages you in the error only can to condemn you after the error can we say amen is that true it is so weird you would you would never think you would do that it just changes on you like that what is that we're going to talk about it in a minute he says this remember now you're you're you you have to have an assurance before him which is at the end of judgment so When you stand before God, he says, if your heart condemns you at the end, that's a time frame. If your heart, hey, I know we talk about your heart condemning you here. I don't really want to talk about my heart condemning me here. We'll talk about at the end. I want to, at the end of the Bible study. I'm talking about your, your heart condemning you at the end of time, at the end of your life. There is a, there is a function that God has built into your heart. <laughs> it's amazing. Your heart... Not yet, not yet. Your heart will flip a flop, a flip a flop, a flip a flop. Agree and condemn and agree and condemn. And your heart will, you know, your, 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 your perverse heart, your, your foolish heart, your, you know, your corrupt heart, it'll, it'll push you towards one thing. But then when you go towards it, that same heart will flop and turn against you. I want everybody to understand that your heart has been designed by God to have one final function. It's going to have a final function. I, I, I've coined the term, the final function. Because your heart goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and you have a lot of fun with it too, right? Because it's, you know, it's, uh, oh! <laughs> and it's going back and forth. You, you, have, you, don't, you, you are confused. You have no idea what it's all about because sometimes it's for you, sometimes it's against you, one minute it's pushing you, next minute it's attacking you. But he said, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. And he knows all things. He knows your hearts. He knows what's inside of it. He, he, I know, but see, right now, there may be some of you who are here who have a heart that's condemning them about something. And I, that's fine for that day. And by the way, if your heart is condemning you right now before I clap my hands and say, thank you, Jesus, because this is the right time for your heart to condemn you. Hey, you do not want your heart condemning you in the end. Can, I want the heart condemning me now. It's a, it's a wonderful thing for you. That's why you've come to church. It is for you to hear the word of God, for your heart to condemn you. It's good. It's not bad. Quit fighting away condemnation. Condemnation is a good thing. Everybody say condemnation. Where, where must judgment begin? In the house of God, it begins with us. We judge us. If, if we're going to judge other people, we got to judge ourselves first. And so he says, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. He knows your heart and he knows all things. Can you imagine God as, as a, uh, just, just think of it. All the creatures who have ever lived in all of the, the, the creation of time, he knows everything that everyone has ever done before you did it. He doesn't, do it, he doesn't know it after. He knew it before you did it, and still he loved you. Still he died for you. Still he called you. Still he put you in, into his kingdom, and still he made you a part of his body. He says this, and if our heart, can, if our heart condemn us, God is greater in our hearts. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, that's a wonderful thing. Your heart can either condemn you, or it can condemn you not. So there's a, there's a point and a time when it is built to condemn you and it is a point and a time when it tries to condemn you but it, it's not able to. It lacks capacity to do that. And God wants our hearts to condemn us. He does want it uh, to do that. And woe to you if your heart does not condemn you. Woe to you. I've seen videos of people who have murdered other people and they're like on the subway laughing and they're having fun. You just killed somebody, yeah! And laughing about it, shaking the gun like, whoa, wow, you are a child of hell for sure. And guess, guess what's happy? Their hearts. 
because it took vengeance. He said this to me, I took it out, bump him twice, put the hot lettuce out of him, and they're happy about it, you know, wow. I am very sure that the Russian soldier, I've seen a Russian soldier, i see seen a Ukrainian soldier fly a drone and just drop it on another man. And he went, wow, your heart's happy, eh? You're happy? You're happy you killed the Russian, did you? Okay, keep that up. You're gonna get a, you're gonna get a, 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 a purple heart, a, a valor, a reward of valor for what you've done. Keep it up. Hmm. We, know, we can, our hearts can be happy at the evil that we do. I mean, and, 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 and you have so far gone beyond what is normal and right in the sight of God that it doesn't, doesn't bother you. You don't want to do that. You don't want that to happen to your heart. You want to have your heart being very sensitive. I'm talking about in the awakened, having an awakened heart, okay? He says, but, but beloved, if our hearts does not condemn us, then we have confidence. You know, we have confidence where? We have confidence towards God. Not only now, but in the future. But I mean, I want to go, I want to be at the end of time. Is where I want to have that confidence towards him. I will not forget a dream which I had. I will never forget it until the day that I stand before Christ. The world was coming to an end. The world was coming to an end. And the only way for us to live was we had to die. Literally, you, 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 they, they had a, a, a place under the earth and they had to put you to sleep. They, they sedated you and put you deep down in the earth in a sort of cry what do you cry cryogenic sleep you know and you were sleeping inside of there and i remember i was inside of my grave and i was deep in the earth and wow i woke up and i was like because like, you could still wake up not for long because it puts you back to sleep again but i i awoke and i when i awoke i was deep down in the earth and i realized that i was in death the very deep sleep that simulated death and in that state I knew that if I have anything bothering my heart I'm not getting out I knew it and so brother George I a sinner in my dream I searched all through my heart i searched my heart brother abbas i searched my heart and i'm looking for all the sins that should be there because if i could i could tell you think of 10 of your sins in in, in you tell you can think of 10, 10 of your sins in two seconds anybody can we we have committed we have committed sins 20 years ago 30 years ago that we can still remember <laughs> if it was a whopper you'll still remember it you know <laughs> and i a sinner awoke and I searched and searched and searched, looking, and I remember what it was looking for. My, my mind was looking for that condemnation. It was looking for that thought. It was looking for that thing. And I searched it and I searched it and I could not think of my error, my wrong. I could not think of it. It was gone from me. And a peace came over me as though I had done nothing wrong. Which is very strange, because I am a sinner. Oh, and so are you, by the way. Forget you. I am a sinner, but I, but I can't think of it. Now, I, God, I know you can remember your sins now, but I guarantee they're going to come a place you will not remember them anymore. If you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you'll never forget them. You will remember them until the day, for, for the endless days. And I searched and I searched and I, and I looked over... And Tammy was, was fast asleep beside me, and I'm like, I wish you'd wake up. <laughs> I remember, and I just went back to sleep like that. You know, we could, you know, if we could have a conversation, it'd be nice, you know, but you're on your own. <laughs> I remember, speaking of Tamara, that, uh, let, me, let me say to you that, that when everything else fails, your heart will not fail. Um... When mother fails, father fails, your church fails, your heart does not fail. When knowledge fails, your heart does not fail. 
Because your heart it, it's running on a principle that it's not your your heart is not really based on knowledge. Your heart is really based on feeling. That's the problem with it. It's just based on feeling. How it feels. He's very concerned about how it feels. And, and your, your, your heart likes to make itself feel good. Even if it's done something, I still feel good. That's why I justify things. Why? So my heart feels okay about what I did. And the reason why your heart does not fail is because your, your spirit doesn't really talk. It understands but your, your spirit is mainly governing you by feelings. And they're very strong feelings as well. Not just feelings that are emotions, but that are triggered by the Word of God. And sometimes when you have fears that are not, are not based on the Word of God, you should get rid of those fears. They're silly. But if your fear is based on the Word of God, then you should say, why am I feeling like that? Because of that, then let's figure it out and let's move on. So... When everything else fails, your heart does not fail. So my wife Tamara, her mother failed, her father failed. They did not teach her the right thing. They never taught her the truth. And my wife was not saved. My wife was not saved. But they told her from she was a little girl that she was saved. And so, unbeknownst to me, when I was somewhere in Canada, there was this poor little girl in the Baptist church somewhere. They went on a camp, or I don't know where, where you were. And Tamara said, what did you say, Tamara? You said what? Something's wrong. Imagine your child saying to you, Daddy, you know, after all you've taught Jacob about God, you spent so much time, and Jacob says to you, Daddy, something is wrong. Everything else has failed, but the heart knows something is wrong. Something don't feel right here. What was wrong, Demi? Everyone was saying she was saved, but her heart knew she wasn't. How did, how did you know? She knew herself, what she was. She knew she hadn't changed. She knew that she didn't know God. I don't, I don't know God. Who is God? Huh? Yeah? Oh, you did too? So here are two girls, two young girls, I don't know them from a bar of soap, who are going to their mother, saying, Mother, something is wrong. <laughs> we feel something is wrong. Look what it says here. We don't actually know God. We know about God, but we actually don't know him for ourselves. We don't know him. We are not saved. Tammy's like, well, just look at how I dress. Tammy, did you used to go and lead the worship in little mini skirts? <laughs> hey, Brother George? She's going up in a little mini skirt to lead, to lead worship at church. If I ever do that to you, Tim, hey, Pastor Rob, yeah. <coughs> you need to get her down. <laughs> We're apostolic. We wear them long. <laughs> And, and so, when I met her, Brother Rodriguez, I, when I met her, I came to, to and God knows, he, like, you know, when someone is saying, Mom, I'm not saved, tr tr help us on the way. If you, because you don't know, mother has failed you, father has failed you, the church has failed you, the pastor, the, everyone has failed you. And they're saying to her, no, you said the sinner's prayer, and you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior when you were what? When you were 11? And Tash, I think Tash accepted these as a person said, like every, every month, see, because she's like, it don't feel, something feel wrong. 
I will accept him again and again and again and again and again until it starts feeling right. <laughs> I said when everything else fails, the heart doesn't. It knows. It just knows. It knows. Because it has one, it, it has, there is something that the heart knows. If I say, if you have died, it's only if you have died and only if you have been buried into Jesus Christ it's only if you have died with Christ that you can never be raised to life and only if you have died and only if you have been buried into Jesus Christ, it's only if you have died with Christ that you can never be raised to life. Born again you must be. Born again, but how can you be born again unless you are planted into Christ? You say that you're born again, and you think that you're born again, but you are not born again because you're not planted into Christ. It's only if you have died, and only if you have been buried into Jesus Christ, it's only if you have died with Christ, that you can never be raised to life. Man, if I heard that, and I was not buried into Christ, that song would bug me. That's a haunting song. That's a cute kid. That, that, would, that would bug me, and I would say to myself, you know what, he, he is actually repeating the scripture. Have I been died with Christ and be buried no, not for some hold on with Christ have I been have I died with Christ and been buried with Christ because the Bible says you cannot be born again unless you are planted into Christ it says that you can't go around it your heart should tell you he's right and so sister Tamara as a young girl when I told her the truth she goes all right are you trying to tell me I'm not saved no, nah, you're not saved. Why? Because you've got to be baptized into Jesus. You need to be baptized. And boy, didn't that condemnation go away? Didn't that condemnation go away? When you, when you, when you, Tashi? And, and, and you began to know God for yourself? You began to. Shh. Say again? Yeah, because she's like, are you trying to say I'm not saved? I'm like, okay, here she goes. I've lost her. Are you trying to say I'm not saved? <clears throat> no, nah, you're not. I didn't know. You're not saved. Okay, you're not saved. And she goes, oh, good. <laughs> good, all right. I need that. I need that condemnation. Hey, she thanked me for condemning her. Tammy, you weren't saved. Thank you. That explains a lot of things. Can you imagine a person... Who's saying, are you trying to say I'm not saved? I'm not? Excellent. That is so good. Praise the Lord. Can, we, can, I, can I please get to understand what salvation is? And so I explained it to her. And, you know, you know it's, it's, it's Tammy and Tash. Eh? If I was here trying to do this by myself, I'd have failed a long time ago. But I don't know. Tammy and Tash, they just seem to inspire people. Because if they can do it, we can do it too, right? <laughs> Brother Alex, when you first came to church, Tammy and Tash, they stuck out to you. I think most people, they, they would stick out like, you know. They just, they just have this godliness about them, you know. So, it's only when I told her the truth, and she heard the truth, and she believed the truth, and she accepted the truth, and she began to live the truth, that her conscience finally was assuaged and she began to not feel that condemnation that was there of the heart which is it's just naturally there after you got baptized 
You felt the difference, uh, yeah, yeah. You just know, yes, I was. You see, forget, the, I, was, I was baptized by Pastor Robert. Forget that. No, I was baptized into Jesus Christ. I know that. The amazing thing was, Brother Hamlet's mother was always afraid of death. And on her tag, she had resuscitate. <laughs> and she was 84 years old, and no matter what happens, she was terrified of death. And every time, every time she told them, resuscitate, they just kept on, kept her going. <laughs> I, was, I was at Kmart with my son Jermaine. Jermaine, I remember what, what a day that was. And there was Hamlet's sister Maria. Sister Nancy, I saw Hamlet's mother on the floor dying. Maria's crying. This one's upset. Paramedics are <laughs> doing everything. And I stood beside Jermaine, stoic and careless. I said, Jermaine, is that lady? Yes, I know her. And I know the mom. And I know them all. Yeah. Guess what? That's not my job to try to save you when you're on your deathbed. Jermaine, let us turn and go shopping in Kmart. Yes? We didn't even say hi to them. We saw them in the trouble. We didn't even pray. We just walked away. <laughs> You're not saved. You've had all the time to get saved. You're not saved. What am I praying? What am I? The Catholic priest? I'm going to shake some holy water on you. What am I? going to change the death? It's the day of your condemnation. I'm not going to save you on that day. Salvation takes time. I'm not Jesus and today should be me in paradise. No, you need to repent. I need to find out what's going on in your life. Let's search it. What's up? What you got? How am I going to save her? She has two idols that she worships every night in her room. She has a Mary idol and a Joseph idol. You don't know that. They're in her bedroom. What am I going to shake holy water on her for? She needs to get rid of those idols. <laughs> so she had a dream. So after I turned away and I walked away from that lady, as mean as I am, because I know my mandate, my mandate is not to save you. Mine is to save you beforehand to get your heart correct before God. Before, get your conscience and your, your heart, you know, to be assured. And she, she said, I'll read my Bible and I want Bible study. Give me Bible study. And I went there and I taught her Bible study. Taught, and God said, do not. It's one of the first times I've done a Bible study with somebody and my spirit said, do not miss. And we're doing two, at least two or three Bible studies in the week. Hurry and don't miss. Get there again. Get there again. But give her, and I'm, and I'm teaching her, and as I'm teaching her, she's absorbing, absorbing, and repeating back. I'm like, wow. You can explain that. Yeah, she explained it. Wow. Amazing. For an 84 year old lady. Yeah, got to get back to Jesus then. That's what you need. Okay. Now, she said, I, yeah, I, and I have, she said to me, I have, the, I have a couple of idols in my um, room. <laughs> you do. Never heard that one before. Yeah, I made them myself. It's a, it's a Mary and Joseph idol. I pray to them. She went out there and took the idols and cast them out. And her, and her favorite word was no peche. What does peche mean? Sin. No sin. No peche. You cannot get in with sin. No peche. Get rid of all the peche. P-E-C-H-E, I think it is. No peche. She taught me that. No peche. No sin. That's right, mama. Now get baptized in Jesus' name. She's frail, you know. And we baptized her. That little frail lady, I picked up her body. And it was he's just easy. Brother, brother Trim? Like 30 kilos, man. <laughs> she weighed nothing. I'm like, Lord, what is man, you know? She was frail as you can get. And I took her and I put her in the water, baptized her in Jesus' name. That lady got up. And when she got up, she's so excited. She started to baptize everybody else. She was like, splash you and splash you and splash her. Remember that, Demi? Very excited. We had, she would eat. We had lasagna. Ate like you wouldn't believe. Look at Mama eat, boy. She ate all this food. We had a great time. Mama got saved. A month later, Mama died. Don't resuscitate. Mama died the most peaceful, happy, not fighting it this time. It was time to go. And how would, you, how would you believe that I walk into the dead lady's room and Brother Hamlet is standing there very angry? He's like, I'm so glad you came because I'm about to kill somebody, you know? You know Hamlet, you know, someone's going to die any moment. And um, 
And, he, and then he felt this peace come over his heart. He's like, what's going on here? I gotta go find that church that can give peace. Where is this, where is this peace coming from? You see, hey guys, we're not, we're not talking about, we're talking about people's life. You can't walk up to somebody who is full of anger and make them feel peace. It's either real or not real. And their heart, it's heartfelt, a calm come over it. And the angry man had no more anger for that thing. And he accepted everything and it was, it was, it was completely brilliant. Okay. You see, your heart has what I call a final function. Can we go to Psalm 104 and verses 5? Let me explain to you the final function. Here, Brother George, is why your heart, you have to be very careful. Psalm 104, verses 5. And let us all be afraid of our hearts. <laughs> Fifteen? Fifteen, sorry. Thanks, Demi. Psalm 104, verses 15. It says this. Uh, verse 14. Um, he causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. And wine... What does wine do? It does what? It maketh the heart of man that, that maketh glad the heart of man. Wine makes your heart glad. Be careful. No sippy sippy. I know a lady. And um, she thought a little sip, a little nightcap. <laughs> said, oh, Pastor Rob, oh, yeah, it's just a little nightcap. Takes the buzz off. I'm like, <laughs> if your heart's telling you that, though, who am I, right? And the Bible, I don't want to argue with you, lady. So after she left to go back home to America, I went to the house. <laughs> that was not sipping, no way. I found so many alcohol bottles. Brother George, you know what, you know, that little sip that started off a little relaxing? You better be careful because it needs more the next week. That woman was drinking her, her, her little heart out and bottles and bottles. No, 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 no. If you have a little sip, you don't have that many bottles. No, no, no. That's, that's, you got drunk before bed is what you did. And the heart very, then the heart said, oh, no, no, just a little, just a little, that. it's just fine, you know, it's all good. Just a little sip, a little nightcap. <laughs> Who was it? Can I call names? I can call names. Sister Robin, this is where we go back a long way. Remember Sister Turkington? Remember, didn't she have, used to have a little nightcap too, Timmy? Did, yes or no? She's dead, so it doesn't matter. She's gone a long time ago. You remember? Remember Sister Turkington? Used to have a little nightcap? Hey, yeah, one of those people. Yeah, what? Well, okay, yeah, a little nightcap. Hey, don't drink alcohol. I condemn it. I condemn it. Before God, I condemn it. Let me see you go home and have your sippy. I condemn it. I condemn it before God. Whatever you bound, I condemn it before God. Let me see you go home and have your sippy. And then stand before God in the end. I have condemned it. <laughs> you haven't got a prayer. I have condemned it. You don't stand a chance. You can, when you stand before God, he'll say, were you above him? No. What did he say? Are you giving instructions to the church? No. What did he say? No nightcaps. You want a nightcap? Yeah, yeah. Get a little, get a little flannel hat and put it on. <laughs> a little red, a little, little pom-pom on it. Yeah, that's your nightcap. And go to bed. Ask God to give you sleep. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. 
Heart, wine makes the heart glad. Watch this. Let's go to Ecclesiastes now, chapter 40. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Am I right, Tammy? Chapter what? Can't be 40. Four? 412? You wrote it down. Proverbs is 12. Ecclesiastes, I think it was Ecclesiastes here. Here, tell me. I'm fine with me again. Hey? No, it, it says that wine makes your heart glad. Now, guys, I mean, long before we started making our vodka, because our really strong drinks that by our distillation processes got more fancy, we can make different things, you know, bourbons and whatever. We basically had wines. It was wines that we drank, you know? What is, hey, what messed up Moses? I mean, Noah? He made some wine. Got himself all messed up. Don't do it. He had a couple of nightcaps, and before you know it... What's that? Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verses 3. We're, we're close then. Lot as well. Oh, yuck. Woo, let's not even go there. No. <laughs> he says, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquaint myself and it's acquaint my heart with wisdom and to lay hold of folly till I might see what was the good of the sons of men, which they did. Hey, he made himself a little happy, but then at the end of the day, he ended up worshiping the gods of his wives. Maybe you shouldn't have been drinking that stuff. I, you know what, Solomon? I don't think the kings of... I don't think the kings and the priests were really supposed to be doing that sort of stuff, but... Anyway. When you put alcohol and mirth together, what's the modern day name for alcohol and mirth? Reveling, clubbing, partying. So everybody, you know, if you're going through a tough time, you know you've had a tough week, the boss was that, this was this, what do you do? You, you go out clubbing. But it's really hard to dance because, you know, you're all inhibited and the heart doesn't want to do it. So what you do is, because your heart is, is bugged and troubled, you drink some alcohol and the alcohol takes the edge off. And before you know it, you get, you know, you start to shake a little bit more, you know, you, you, you know? And the more you drink, the more you, you know what I'm saying? Oh! And you know, hey, well, ah, you're, you're starting to drink a little more, you're getting a little bit less inhibited. Right or wrong? Your heart becomes very happy. Has the trouble gone away? No. Is the problem gone? Is it still there? Yes. You've gotten your heart drunk, and your heart is happy to party with you. You see, the heart doesn't condemn you when it's drunk. It parties with you. But the heart has one final function. After you've partied, after this, after that, after everything else, it doesn't matter how much you, after all of it, the heart comes at the end and either and, and either condemns you or tries to condemn you, but it can't. The final function of the heart is not to agree with you. The final function of the heart is not to, is not to, um, to have, uh, uh, make mirth with you. That's not the final function of the heart. Because it takes into consideration all the aspects of your life. Everything, it weighs everything, it knows everything. And the Bible says that God tries the heart and he reigns and he, and he weighs it. You see, to God, he knows what it is. He knows if your heart is heavy, he knows if your heart is light, he knows what's going with the heart all the time. And he said, heart, I know, you, without, when, when a man, you know, you ever see me say, oh, my, my heart's just not in it. I, I've got this new job, yeah, it's a great job, pays good money, but my heart's not in it. Because without the heart, it's very hard to function. The heart must agree 
what's going on, you know? And, and, and you know, it's really funny, like, uh, you know, with our, in, our, in our new LGBTQ world, which we live in there, hey, here is what happens when you stand before you work with LGBTQ people, all right? God looks at your heart, you know. Let's say you were LGBTQ, let's say you were, okay? Yeah, my workplace. It's, it's not right for me to go. Not right for me to go. But God knows my heart. So I come and I said, hello, how are you? You're good? God knows my heart. That kid used to hold his breath. When he would pass the kids that were in the school that weren't straight, he'd go like... I don't know, I'm not breathing whatever you got, man. <laughs> Maybe it's by the air, I don't know, I'm not breathing it. <laughs> I, thought that was, I thought that was really, really funny. Jaren cracks me up. You know, but it's the heart. And God knows if in your heart you're agreeing. If you're okay with it. And not just that, but there are many things that are around us, uh, families and friends and this and that, and, and God knows, like in your brain, you're, you're being decent, because it is incumbent upon you as a Christian to be decent, but your heart is not happy. I'm not happy with what you're doing and what you're about. See, because God tries the heart, he, he, he knows he tries the reins of the heart, and he weighs it, he knows whether you're in agreement or not. And that's why I told Lot's wife, hey, Lot's wife, yeah, do not look back. Why? Because it's an act of obedience, but if you have things back there that, you know, you might... You know, maybe it's curiosity. I don't think it's curiosity because God said, don't look back. But if there are things back there that, oh, you know, the one, you ever know that, that one last good, goodbye, that look? God said, don't look. And she looked. And, and she what? She turned into a pillar of salt. Because her heart was somehow connected to that world, you know? She wanted to be there. If you do the wrong thing, your heart, I always said, it's a judicial system. You, you, yeah, yeah, it's a lot your heart will pass judgment on you it'll judge you thank you jesus that my heart can judge because if your heart didn't judge you you wouldn't be able to repent our hearts judge us and so we know something is wrong because especially when it lines up with the word you know then it, the word said this you know so when our, when our hearts when our hearts judges us and our heart condemns us like it did for judas you can't live if you've done something really wrong, no matter how long you hide it for, that's why they have these deathbed repentance. Someone's about to die. You got away with it, yeah, but, but you're gonna die. Yeah, I just don't wanna die with this in my heart. I wanna get it out of my heart. I just, I just gotta say this, you know? And so, people will say, uh, oh, <laughs> I read about the, a girl and her dad was like a, a wanted bank robber, and she didn't know. And then he, he's about to die. So I said, yeah, another bank robber? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> Your dad, just get, it, just get it out there, you know. Hey, eh? Too late, you know. What he should have done is give himself in, take a sentence, go repent, say to God, sorry. I'm sorry. And God who weighs the heart knows the heart will give him. Uh, the forgiveness that he needs. You know, David kid, David, um, can we just throw in one last, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, 5, then I'm done after that. A nice, light, easy Bible study that explains something about yourself. No one here is to trust their hearts. It's not your friend. You can silence it and tell it to be quiet. And it'll, it'll seem like it's quiet, but it has a final function. Hey guys, just because your heart is not condemning you, most likely you've told it to be quiet. So it doesn't bother you anymore because you told it, quiet! Quiet! But it has the final function. And at the end of time, the final function will come forth. And the final function is, I'm going to condemn you. Okay, I'll be quiet. Well, okay, fine, I won't talk. That's fine. I won't say nothing. Man... 
Lord, let my heart keep on talking. Um, 24 and verses 5. In, in 24, you need to learn this. In 24 and 25. Um, in 24 and 25, there's something to learn. First, let's learn it from 24. And then, let's see the ultimate punishment in 25. In 24 and verses 5 in Samuel, it says this. And I'm so glad the Lord put them so close together. And, and they're so closely associated in, in scripture it says verses 4 and the men of David said unto him behold the day of the day of which the Lord said unto thee behold I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand that thou mayest do unto him as it seemed good unto thee then David arose and cut off he just cut off the skirt not his neck not his arm he just cut off the skirt of Saul's robe Privily, just quietly. Just cut it off. He cut off his robe. And it came to pass after he did that, that David's heart smote him. I made, I made you jump. I made you jump. I got you. I got you. Good. Ah. His heart. Get ready for it, Cardi. I'm ready. His heart. She's ready. Okay. Smote him. <laughs> I scared the poor kids. David's heart smote him. Smote him for what? Because he touched the Lord's anointed. Don't do it. Just don't do it. It's amazing how people can condemn the man of God and not feel anything. And curse me and speak badly and not feel anything. What? Mm, okay. Your heart should smite you. Tashi, you say bad stuff about me? Your heart should get. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Please, Lord, let my heart smite me if I say or do the wrong thing. I want it to smite me because I don't want at the end of time it fulfills its final function, which is to condemn me. Condemn me now! Let me come to church with a heavy heart knowing that I have done wrong and let my heart say, man, Rob, you shouldn't have done that, man. You shouldn't have said that. And let me repent before God that he may forgive me of my transgression and make myself right and go out. But not then. His heart smote him. And he repented. But here's another man, Nabal, whose heart also smote him. He was a, he was a man of Belial, mean man, wouldn't help David. And so David came to kill him. His wife came and interceded. Um, look what it says. And David, his wife lived with Abigail. And David, verses 32, 25, next, 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 verse 32. David said unto, unto Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day, because I was going to kill your husband for, what, for, for his ungratefulness. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, verses 34, for in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hadst hastened and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal, or husband, by the morning, like any males. So David received of her hand that which, verse 35, that which, uh, that which uh, she had brought unto him, and said unto her, Go up in peace into thine house, uh, and, and, and see, I have hearkened, I'm not going to, it's okay. Listen to verse 36. And Abigail came to Nabal. And Nabal, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him. For he had drunken. <laughs> Sister Charmaine, he has done such an evil thing. God was so good to him, he did not honor the Lord. He has done this evil thing, and his heart's like, yes, go party, 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 party. Ah! <laughs> and it came to pass in the morning, um, and um, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning. Why? Because he's inebriated, he can't understand properly. And it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal and his wife had told him these things 
his heart died within him and he became as a stone. Total condemnation. He, he, can't, he couldn't move forward anymore. He couldn't move backward anymore. He couldn't move sideways anymore. It just left him in a state of condemnation. My beloved, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. It's, if our hearts can condemn us, God will condemn us. He's greater than the hearts. He, he will find, if you, you think your heart can find fault, God will find more fault than your heart can find. And he became a stone. He became a stone. He died on the inside. You see, you see the power of the heart? And, it, it, and, it, and when she told him that, she just told him what happened. All she did was she just told him what happened and his heart died. Poor Nabal. If only he could repent. Everybody say, I can repent. Everybody tell the devil. I can repent. <laughs> Amen. Hey, if you have died, and if you have been buried into Jesus Christ, hey, if you have died with Christ, Unless you have died with Christ, you can never be raised to life. I said, only if you have died, and only if you have been buried into Jesus Christ, oh, unless you die with Christ, you can never be raised to life. Born again, you must be born again. But how can you born again unless you have died with Christ? It's my prayer at the end. I'm not going to pray anymore past this. It's only if you have died and if you have been buried into Jesus Christ. It's only if you have died with Christ that you can never be raised to life. One more time, say, if you have died and if you have been buried into Jesus Christ, it's only if you have died with Christ that you can never be raised to life. And your heart knows whether or not you have been buried with Christ. I say, with Christ alone. Nothing else, just with Christ. Your heart knows. In Jesus' name, amen.